a little hello and lots of love to start a day. Have a beautiful morning and an amazing day ahead. It's my pleasure to welcome our chief guest and the participants on behalf of the Department of English. I would like to welcome you all for the Noel's Three and Plato to Postmodernism and Beyond. Preview of Holocaust Studies. I would like to thank everyone who helped us to run first two Noel's program very successfully. On this special day, I would like to invite Ms. A. Nafila Mam, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Swati. I extend to you all the warmest greetings on behalf of the PG and Research Department of English, Sri Saraswati Thyagaraja College. It is an absolute delight to welcome you all to our third national, national online expert lecture series on Plato to Postmodernism and Beyond. I welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. D. Laura Damaris Chelladurai, Associate Professor, Department of English, Bharati Dasan University, who will be sharing her profound insight on the topic, a preview of Holocaust studies. Welcome, ma'am, and thank you for being a part of our lecture series. I welcome Dr. V. Selvan, Vice Principal and Head, Department of English, Sri Saraswati Tyagaraja College. I welcome professors of various capacities, research scholars, students, and other participants who have joined together in the spirit of learning and intellectual curiosity. I also welcome my dear colleagues and our students for this enlightening lecture. May this lecture inspire us and broaden our horizons of knowledge. Thank you for joining together on this special day. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Next, I would like to invite Ms. D. Srija, ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to introduce the speaker. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our lecture series. It's my pleasure to introduce our chief guest, Dr. D. Laura Jamarius Chalajodi, Associate Professor, Department of English, School of English and Other Foreign Languages, Badirasan University, Trichara Pili, who has graciously accepted our invitation to join us today. Dr. D. Laura Jamaris Chanajodi is a highly accomplished individual in the field of education. She has more than two decades of teaching experience and she has supervised more than 60 ample scholars and four doctorates and has done more than 65 special lectures. She has contributed a lot of research articles and she has been also a course content contributor. She is a Board of Studies member in various colleges. She has received many accolades. Her research areas are Holocaust studies, women's life writing, Bactinian poetics, linguistics, and translation. <clears throat> On behalf of our department, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our chief guest. I'm sure that this interaction will be a valuable learning experience. With that, now I invite our respectable chief guest, Dr. Laura, to address our esteemed gathering. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I hope I am audible. Yeah, ma'am, you're audible. Yes, I'm happy to be with you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful words of welcome and introduction. I also place my uh, gratitude to Dr. Selvin, who invited me to speak on that. In fact, I think now I'm more, so, more asked to speak on Holocaust. Um, though I thought I contemplated on some other topics, um, Dr. Selvin, insisted that I would speak on this. And I thought, since it's an area of uh, potential research, and um, since Holocaust is a genocide that happened not in a very distant past, and um, the silence and the ignorance regarding that uh, is quite appalling in our area, in our topography, I should say. So I thought maybe this is a, a way of introducing what has happened and also open up this vast area of research as well. So I will just start my screen sharing. I will stop my video too. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am, we can uh, see your slide. Please go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I have titled my lecture as The Path to Genocide, a Holocaust Review. How did this genocide happen? You know, this genocide, before we go into what uh, Holocaust is made of and how did it come to be, I will just give you um, 
a very quick uh, run into what a genocide is. So we know uh, the clear meaning of what genocide is. I will also come back to it again, but to start with, we will just see the uh, etymology of genocide. Genocide, genus, we all know, is a race, tribe, or nation. And side is killing from the Latin word side. So this term was coined by Raphael Lem Lemkin, a Polish-born jurist. Uh, and uh, the history of this word, the word he was co he, uh, Lemkin coined, itself is quite fascinating. I cannot go past this word without giving my due respects to Lemkin because of the decades of work that he did in bringing this word genocide into the international law. Uh, he had to wage a long uphill battle to bring this. This is Raphael uh, Lemkin. He was born in 1900 uh, and he studied law. He was born in Poland a very brilliant student, uh, but he has a, he was a man of a very sensitive heart. And so whatever happened in this world disturbed him deeply. During the First World, world War time, the world witnessed a very, very uh, gruesome genocide, which was not uh, known to the world outside, Armenian genocide, where uh, the Ottoman Turkish um, uh, um, forces killed more than a million people. And uh, so at least 80,000 people died of starvation. It was one of the worst genocides in history. But the government could not be prosecuted because there was no international law mentioning without even having a name for this genocide. And so uh, Lemkin uh, sat and worked very hard. And, he, you know, it, where, when you I have also in my end of the slide, I have given a, a YouTube video of how he defined uh, this word uh, genocide. It has a very, very long history and he poured over so many vocabulary. He uh, the His manuscript is also there. Quite interesting how he reached this word genocide. And not only that name uh, was coined by him, he was a lawyer by profession, but he, he worked tirelessly to get that word into the genocide convention of the UN. He did that with League of Nations, but he did not succeed. And um, then remarkably in 1933, uh, 1939, the Holocaust started. The another genocide started. And he was surprised that he himself was um, culpable to that. Uh, he was uh, under this uh, genocide. And so he fled. He fled uh, to US and he took up a teaching position in Duke University. Yet he was tirelessly campaigning. He had no other obsession in his uh, life except to bring this word into genocide convention and finally uh, in 1948 the genocide convention approved this word and you know why this is important is when only when this word is approved then nations or perpetrators can be uh, taken into law can be tried in the international court so this is one man's crusade for bringing this word, not only introducing the term, but also making this term as a means of um, international law, also bringing it into the international law. So <laughs> now, uh, what, uh, what is genocide? Because we saw a uh, killing of a race or a, an ethnic group. So we have uh, many different views of uh, what a race is and what ethnicity is. So I thought I would just, uh, I will be going quite a bit fast. But for you to know, race, this is a very old time definition of what race is. Race is biological. And we also see in Francois Bernier's work, he was um, the contemporary of Descartes and uh, Gassendi. And he says, these um, human, entire human beings of the world can be, divided into Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, and as Australoid. We will, as Asians, we will come under Mongoloid. But, you know, this is how the uh, demarcation of uh, races begin. But we are not going by this definition now because the world has increasingly become multiracial and uh, it is so hard for us to identify as one race. So we have, uh, we do not go by that. But by and large, till the end of 20th century, this uh, race theory was very uh, held currency. 
Then we come into what is ethnicity. Ethnos, again, it comes from the word ethnos also means a nation, but it is more sociological. You know, you can get into, uh, you can come from uh, North India, but if you are here uh, for three generations in Tamil Nadu, you somehow become so much into the culture, the food and the tradition, and you would still, you can somehow become, you know, uh, not naturalized, but you will get on a new ethnicity, so to say. So it is uh, defined as a sense of common ancestry based on cultural attachments. You know, if you are here for many generations, you get into that kind of a cultural att attachment and uh, you your ethnicity can be changed also. But in 1960s, ethnicity was often used to describe minority groups, groups of different cultural tradition origin that coexisted with a larger majority group. In the case of Amer American society, we will see Afro-American as a different race, not as a uh, an ethnicity. But uh, the, uh, Stuart Hall also speaks about race, race and ethnicity, and he also looks into the intersectionality and also the blurring of boundaries when it comes to race, race and ethnicity. Uh, it is, uh, But why this is important is race and ethnicity became the denominators for a genocide and uh, and especially during the time of nazism which came into power in germany in 1933 uh, race was very important because they also had institutions of race to deal with this uh, inferior and superior race and so it is a category of people who have been singled out as inferior or superior if um, most of us are students of literature and we know that uh, prior to modernism, the um, white was the center of the world. We know that as the white, as uh, the European, the West becomes the center of the world and then everything else became the other. So race was held superior. We are still speaking about that age. It was only during postmodernism and postcolonialism you had this uh, polarity being challenged later on. But you know, the skin color, the hair tuck, texture, the eye shape, and all these things were, uh, all these things determine what race, which race a person belonged to. Ethnic group is also a collection of people distinguished by themselves primarily on the basis of cultural and nationality characteristics. I am building this argument so that we will um, define how a Jew is being perceived in all the nations that they were hounded. Um, can someone mute? Uh, yeah, I have a, I could not. Yeah, okay, thank you. So again, coming back to this uh, um, definition, the destruction of a deliberate and systematic destruction of a group of people because of their ethnicity nationality, religion, or race. So if you know what a genocide is, I think this will actually help you realize the genocides that are still happening around us. When you know the meaning of the word and uh, why it is important, and we know that genocides are not done with 75 years or 50 years, we still have it right under our, under our noses in our own times. So as students, we have to be and learners, we have to be aware of what the term genocide is. So coming back to coming uh, to this uh, term, the, uh, diaspora, you know, we all uh, read so much about uh, diaspora, but this word diaspora actually came into currency. Only uh, after the first dispersion of Jews happened from Jerusalem, from Israel, what we call it today, Israel is a very contentious place. But Israel was a country which was very much there and before 2000 years. And uh, when Tiberius Caesar came and occupied, uh, uh, it was under the Roman occupation already. You all know that when Jesus was crucified, it was Pontius Pilate who washes his hands off. So it was already under the colonial rule of the Romans. But Tiberius Caesar in 70 AD, he destroyed the entire city. Um, they had the lore, the uh, the lore of that history tells that the blood was flowing till the hooves of the horses. You know, the blood was flowing freely. It was such a massacre, 
and the temple was burnt. They said, uh, because somebody said the temple, the Jewish temple, uh, which was rebuilt by Herod, uh, it was uh, said that uh, Herod built uh, having a gold between the bricks. And so Caesar saw to it that the entire uh, temple was burnt so that when it is burnt, the gold will melt. So there was not even one stone upon one stone. It was totally destroyed. And it was this period that the Jews from Israel, they scattered around the world. They went as far as to China, as far as to India, to Afghanistan, you will be surprised at the places where they had gone and made home. But majority of them uh, stayed close by in Europe, Europe at that point of time. Uh, but one thing which is very, very remarkable about Jews is that they are a society which, uh, which uh, is glued together by the laws of Moses. So it is a theocentric society. Their entire life was uh, held by the Mosaic law. When they were in Israel, when they had the temple, they flouted Mosaic laws. And But when they were in diaspora, they became very conscious that they do not have the temple, that they are not, away from, land is very, very important for them. So when they are again away from the land, they made it very um, um, extra careful that they did not acculturate with the people around them. That means that you do not... Uh, make you mingle with the people around them. So if they went to a place like um, Spain, for example, they lived together in groups and they married within themselves. They kept their language intact and uh, their dietary um, practices were very different in the sense there is a verse in the Bible which says you should not cook uh, the mother's, uh, the mother's, uh, um, the calf's meat in the mother's milk. So they always have kosher kitchens. Kosher kitchens will not mix dairy and meat. So every Jewish family, any observant Jew even today, they will uh, have kosher kitchens. They will have two sink. They will have two vessels. They will not use the vessel for milk for the meat. So, you know, these dietary practices were very odd to other people. And so they were always um, looked at with suspicion. I'm speaking about the scattered years when they were scattered throughout Europe but they had a thing with money they knew how to make money keep money and uh, they were wealthy uh, and also why why was it is a quite an interesting subject to learn why was a Jew in a money laundering business why was he only flourishing in the money business I, I recently read that in many countries where they were there they were not allowed to own land they were not allowed to um, um, work on their land and uh, in many countries, not in uh, uh, not as a prevalent case, but in many countries. And so the only thing that they could was bartering and uh, money lending. So you see um, that was something which was uh, happening to them. And um, when we look into literature as such, in literature we find the Jew as not as a favorable character at all. You see, throughout, they are always uh, stereotyped as hook-nosed and uh, greedy and avaricious. And you also know this from Barabbas, Shylock, Isaac the Jew, and uh, Fagin. So, you know, Jews were not at all portrayed in good light. I think only uh, even in uh, The Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare puts the humane in the Jew because he, though finally, you know, at the end of it, Shylock uh, lost his battle. Uh, but, you know, Shakespeare, you have to give credit to Shakespeare for giving these lines to us because, you know, this is one place where he allows Shylock to justify himself. He says, you know, why did I ask for that? Because I am a Jew, hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed by the same food, hurt by the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same minutes, means warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? So, you know, that is very, very uh, pertinent. And he, you know, gives reason why he wanted, uh, why did he, why he wanted to avenge 
so you know Shakespeare is uh, one person who makes the Jew a human being, and he says, "I am, I resemble it, and if we are like you in the rest, we shall resemble you at that in also uh, making getting revenge." So these are the background, and also before uh, coming to this twentieth uh, century, there were a lot of pogroms in. Uh, history, especially in Spanish, during Spanish Inquisition, so many Jews were killed. And whenever there was a, um, there was a calamity breaking out, for example, when Black Death happened, many Jews were rounded up and killed. And uh, Jews were never safe in Europe, um, mostly because Europe, most nations in Europe in third century AD became Christian. And um, Jews had this uh, tag of being Christ killers. So that also accentuated the fact that they were not safe. But, you know, um, uh, in other parts of the world, they were relatively safe, uh, safe for in India or in Iran. There were many Jews who settled in Iran, Persia. It was then Persia or in uh, Afghanistan. So, but, you know, in the most uh, European nations, they were never safe. Firstly, because of the tag of uh, carrying Christ killers. And uh, next, because they were very, very good in uh, uh, economics and the first bank, in fact, was started by the Rothschild family, who is again a Jew. And uh, they became, as years uh, when they became populous and they started um, settling and they are, when they are, they're called shtetls, you know, they are big ghettos. Uh, ghettos is a word where there was not uh, much uh, um, uh, conveniences of life. But previously, they all lived in designated places and they became quite rich. They became very affluent. If you will see the early, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, most of the academics in the universities of Europe were um, remarkably Jews. Many of them were Jews. Uh, but, you know, it was uh, somehow, it take a very ghastly turn in uh, post-first uh, um, uh, war uh, Germany, when Hitler came to power just because of his uh, speaking skills and also that Germany lost, uh, had a very, very uh, um, humiliating defeat in First World War. And uh, they were looking forward to a person who will give them hope in terms of their nationhood because they felt very defeated as a nation. And he gave them the right ammunition. He gave them the right words. And he also, again, he sought somebody to blame. And uh, when he sought someone to blame, the Jews were the easy target. And by then, their population was much, very much. Uh, another one reason scholars point out uh, why Hitler was, con uh, he concentrated only the Jew. It was not only because of the Jew, but, uh, you know, it was uh, Hitler also at that point of time. Germany had lost out on the colonial race. When you see England, England had uh, colonies across the world. They had monopoly over the seas and they had uh, colonies across the world. And if you look at uh, Spain, even a country like France, Netherlands, all of them had colonies. But you don't see a German colony in any other non-European nation. And when, uh, But Hitler had very great ambitions. He had great ambitions of conquering. But the previous uh, monarchy, they, they did not have any idea of conquering and so he desired to have more place for his own people and he wanted more room this is uh, in German called Lebensraum Lebensraum means he wanted living room and the, he first cast his eyes on Poland Poland was always being occupied by Germany but Poland was a very very large country and also uh, one third of uh, population in uh, Poland were Jews so for him it was a, a double-edged um, solution for him. You exterminate all the Jews, you clear the Jews, you have more living space and you have the land also. And his uh, expansionist uh, aims did not end with Germany. But you see, uh, during the course of it, he goes till, uh, he occupies France and he is uh, going till, uh, he comes to the doorstep of Britain. It was then the D-Day begins, the Allies come in and they storm Germany. So the Second World War actually comes into being. So then Hitler also came, uh, the first night, he first came to power in 1933. And uh, the entire 1933, the first regime was fully on propaganda, on speaking uh, mostly against the Jews. And um, 
turning an entire nation against their own neighbors, against their own teachers, against their own doctors. And it was so easy for him uh, just to point out that they are based on a different race. Uh, you, As you know, since they have uh, gone from Asia, you see Israel was in Asia, they are the Semitic race. They are part of the Semitic race. They have dark eyes and uh, black hair. You also see that in Ivanhoe. In Ivanhoe, um, you have a mention of Rebecca bewitching the Knight Templar with a dark eyes and black hair. The hair like a crow. You know, that itself is a very, very bad uh, kind of uh, an, uh, a connotation. So here, that was something which stood out for them because uh, Jews as a race were were distinguished by their uh, darker skin. And uh, though they lived uh, for a longer time in Europe, very little um, acculturation happened. They did not mingle with other races. The um, mingling of other races that you see the Jew now who are Ashkenazi, which uh, those who are much European, this mingling happened much later. Maybe in the 20th and 21st century, now you have these uh, blue-eyed, uh, blonde hair Jews. But, you know, at that point of time, you did not have. You had uh, most of them because they did not mingle. They did not mingle with other races. It could have happened in very few cases. But those who lived together and they worshipped together, they had this. Uh, it was so easy for them to single out. So it was uh, Hitler's pro pogrom uh, was to completely destroy Jews, not only from Germany, but also of entire Europe. So he was very, very ambitious about it. His uh, one main goal was to uh, destroy Jews, you know, because destroying Jews, what does it entail uh, Germany when Jews are destroyed? The first thing you get is the enormous economic uh, benefit to them because they were, they were highly successful and uh, they had enormous amount of money and uh, they they want they were cash strapped because germany is just out of a war and they wanted the money so it is easy for them to get the money and so when you exterminate a race exterminate an entire people group based on a, a very flimsy condition that as a race they are uh, inferior you don't need a big justification for that so the word holocaust here uh, means a whole burnt, a whole burnt offering. But today, uh, Jewish scholars and uh, Holocaust survivors, they are not very happy with the term because they say, you know, we are not sacrificed. We were murdered. Uh, Jews do not use the word, uh, even as uh, six million killed, they, they say six million murdered. They said we were not there as willing sacrifice. We were murdered. So um, show us the term that it is used today in Holocaust research. But uh, this in this part of the world, for us, even Holocaust is a very, very new term. Uh, just we have heard it somewhere. And that is why I still use the term Holocaust because of uh, the familiarity, at least the faint familiarity that we have here. And um, yeah, as we said, uh, Hitler's genocide was based on race. Nazism is his... Uh, brainchild, National Socialist Party. He brought this nationalist, nationalist Socialist Party, ironical though. Uh, so Nazism is, uh, his party is called the Nazi Party, which came and then they destroyed all the democratic functionings of the government. They rounded up every leader who will speak for democracy. Uh, so that, that uh, politics is, uh, aside, we will come only to the Jews of Germany. Uh, so they were all murdered, as I said. Two, one out of every three Jews had been killed between 1939 and 45. It was a very, very short, uh, short duration in the sense, not even five years. But they managed to kill six million. Will be 60 lakh Jews. And not only did he deport, uh, you know, if you remember the first slide, you had um, the. This is the, yeah, uh, the railroads which brought Jews from Akkuras. This is the entrance to the camp, the concentration camp, the Auschwitz com concentration camp. And, you know, all the rail lines were uh, left. And so the Jews from across the world, uh, sorry, across Europe, from Spain, from uh, Hungary, from Romania, from Poland, 
uh, this Auschwitz is actually in Poland. He built the largest concentration camp, not in Germany, but in Poland. Though in Germany also, there were a lot of concentration camps. But the most important and the largest uh, concentration camps was built in Poland, Auschwitz. This is the entrance to Auschwitz. And um, day and night, cattle cars, you know, they uh, put this closed car, cattle cars and they put um, um, as many as 100 to 200 uh, Jews inside. They were packed like sardines and then they were brought into constantly into this uh, place where uh, the able-bodied people will be taken into labor because they needed um, um, manpower in the industries as Germany was entering into Second World War. So they needed people to uh, work for them. At the same time, children, old people were instantly sent to gas chambers. So gas chambers were already built and it was working there. This is a picture of Axis powers, uh, all the green countries. They were all uh, supporters. I, they were the either the countries which were being um, conquered by Germany or the ones which supported Germany. So right from Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, Croatia, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Switzerland, France, Belgium, all the Jews from across Europe, they were continuously being transported and uh, they were slaughtered in the slaughterhouses of uh, Auschwitz. But even before that, um, the unit of Nazis uh, military were called the SS units. Mo the SS units, they also had mobile killing units. They used to, I didn't put all those pictures because some pictures are so gruesome. They made the Jews uh, build, uh, dig uh, deep ditches and then they made them stand in a single file and kill them. So they all fell face down into the ditch they built. And uh, in that way, they killed a lot of people. But in the camps, it was one million who were dead. So what was a Jew for them? How did they um, bring in this Nuremberg laws are very important because the Nuremberg uh, laws were the ones which... Uh, uh, sealed the fate of Jews. You know how slowly this started happening. So how did they classify a Jew? Anyone even who had three or four grandparents was a Jew. Even if you had one grandparent at a, at a point of time, you were classified as a Jew. And uh, in one fine morning, German Jews woke up to the fact that they are not Germans anymore. They did not have a citizenship. So when you're not a citizen, this is very important. When you do not have a citizen, when you are not a citizen, you do not have any right. You do not have a right to speak. You do not have a right to work. You do not have a right to property. So the moment when their citizenship was stripped from them, uh, they were first uh, prohibited to marry outside the community because, you know, at that point of time, Germany was very, very progressive. And uh, if you want to know who were the Germans living there at that time, you will identify um, Freud. Freud was there. Einstein was there. Albert Einstein was there. Albert Einstein had actually come to US for a conference and they, his friends retained him there. They said, you, we, not, we are not allowing you to go back. Freud from Vienna, he ran, he fled from Vienna to Britain. And you have even Karl Marx is a Jew. And um, Walter uh, Benjamin, Walter Benjamin was a very sad casualty of uh, a Holocaust because when he know when he, he came to know he was one of this um, Frankfurt school he was the founders one of the founders of the Frankfurt school and he could uh, come till Spain Spain is the point from where they took a, a boat or a ship to US so he was about to hop ship the next day but the night before somebody said uh, the Nazis have already come to search for you and he was so terribly afraid. He did not want to be uh, caught by the Nazi uh, because of all the humiliation that ensued. So he committed suicide the night before. So you also have a, a very uh, casualty of war. So these were all accultured. Um, they were uh, very progressive Jews in Germany. And you uh, have a very orthodox Jews in Eastern European, in Eastern Europe. But so many, uh, even though they were um, um, great musicians, university professors, it did not matter to them. All it mattered to them was they were just Jews. And so professionals were dismissed and their property Aryanized means they were uh, just taken over by Germans and um, they were bought by Germans and uh, they had to pay a price to the Nazi, to the government. And so, you know, the government became very wealthy. 
And this is also uh, something they started with the study of eugenics in Nazi Germany. Uh, Eugene Fischer, he founded, you know, all these people, all those who were not extremely brilliant, those who are mediocre, they were the ones who seized the opportunity. And then they felt, you know, that they can they can find out something big. And every uh, eugenic research in Nazi Germany at that time, it was uh, founded on the false premise that there is an evidence for a racial inferiority. They felt, you know, they must have smaller brains. They must have different uh, physiological organs. You know, I'm not going into the gruesome details of how the... A study of eugenics happened in Nazi Germany. In fact, one of my scholars is working on that. Uh, and every day it's uh, gruesome in the sense they cut open uh, their brains to uh, weigh them. And here, you know, you have this photograph where they um, measure the skull, measure the skull. They measure the size of the nose and they have different color cards to see which color whether they are yellow or brown or between yellow and brown. So they have many color cards also. So this was, uh, uh, they made it, you know, in one of this uh, texts that she's doing, there is this little girl, a twin girl, and uh, they measured her year, her year for two hours. She had to sit in a place, then they will measure her year. But, you know, there was uh, no um, sensible research which came out of it. And also at the end of it, they destroyed much of their research because they also uh, injected uh, typhus uh, bacteria into the, um, they were used as guinea pigs. They did all the horrific experiments on the bodies of Jews. So, and they became, you know, uh, very, um, one basic premise was they thought they will find some evidence of racial inferiority, which never happened. So the path to the genocide was, First, they destroyed the property on one night in November 1938. They destroyed all the property of um, the Jewish, uh, Jews business, Jewish businesses. And it was a night of the broken uh, glass, crystal nacht. It means a night of the broken glass where they destroyed all their properties. The next day, not only had the Jews to clean their property, but they also had to pay the damage done to their own homes. To the government so you know some of them started fleeing but most of the jews thought germany is such a progressive country they cannot possibly kill us and they had this false sense of security that they stayed and so after they were stripped of citizenship the next step is that they ghettoized them the largest ghetto is Warsaw ghetto ghetto is somewhere where they are still not um subjected to the final solution final solution is liquidation that is, you are killed. That is, in the concentration camps, you had on one side labor camps, and on the other side, you have uh, the gas chambers where they used to send uh, all the old people and the children and kill them. But before that, you had this ghettoization where they had huge ghettos, and Jews cannot go out of it. They had to be in the ghettos. But, you know, there was uh, people in the ghettos Oh, who th yeah, this was a uh, final solution. Just before uh, final solution, they had to go to the ghettos. The civil liberties were lost. Uh, in the ghettos, they had to wear the yellow star that um, identifies them as a, a Jew. Some of them were sent even then to labor camps and most of them were sent to concentration camps. In Auschwitz alone, we see one million uh, murdered and most famous other concentration camps are Ravensbrück. Buchenwald and Vilna. There are a lot of camps, you know, they say 44,000 concentration camps were there and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington has um, published uh, an encyclopedia of that. So coming to uh, the tradition of uh, Jews, how do we come to know so much about uh, the Jewish killing is that Either way, on one side, Germans are very good documentation keepers, document keepers. So they document it. But Jews, as by tradition, they have this watchword, zakor. Zakor, you know, by tradition, they remember everything. If you, uh, if you have turned the pages of the Bible, you will know. Because uh, when you look into uh, numbers, you have write the genealogy of every person who was there. And in Chronicles, Ezra, Matthew. So as a tradition, it is an essential Jewish tradition for them to remember. So when you when the most important festival is Passover, and uh, Passover is a festival where the children should ask a question, 
why do we celebrate this and they will tell the entire history going back to moses so it's a day long affair so they will be speaking and speaking and speaking so when uh, they started when the jews uh, felt very threatened and knew something ominous is going to happen people started yeah. recording that was yeah. very very yeah. important yeah. the tradition of remembering is quite uh, important especially yeah. i would uh, uh, bring you bring to light on emmanuel ringelblum he and three other people in the warsaw ghetto warsaw ghetto they formed a, a group project called onek shabbat that means joy of shabbat, shabbat because he felt something was amiss something is going to happen because they are stripped of their citizen rights and these are actually uh, polish jews polish jews had no citizenship they were now um, prisoners of war so they, but you know he started documentation he started how every day they had to give up their able bodied people every day they had to give uh, uh, send children to be uh, killed and so he and uh, he made everyone to write about it write about their food ration stamps write about uh, how uh, uh, the nazi soldiers treated them and after writing everything they used to get metal tin cans and metal milk cans and he uh, put their stories their personal stories the um, uh, receipts they got the receipts of deportation all these he put them in uh, huge uh, milk cans aluminium milk cans and he buried in the ghetto with the hope that one day the world will come to know but uh, there were survivors in this ghetto also after the war was over after uh, the second world war and all the jews were liberated the surviving jews were liberated there were people who survived who brought back uh, people back to the warsaw ghetto and they unearthed these cans so these were the cans where they had put all these um, uh, documentation their names and how many people were there what were they made to do in ghetto so this was just a step before they were all killed emmanuel ringelblum did not survive the holocaust he died in the concentration camp and these uh, were retrieved these milk cans were retrieved and uh, one of the milk cans you can see this uh, it is now um, as a display in us holocaust memorial museum washington dc if you go there you can still see that uh, the real uh, evidence of what has happened so now coming to holocaust studies actually so i had to kind of uh, build up uh, the background because uh, without the background it is so difficult for us to understand the enormity of holocaust studies um, you know but it was such a very horrific uh, experience for most of them when they had when the people went into jews went into the auschwitz when they went into the concentration camps even in ghettos they were they had their own dresses they were in very straitened circumstances but they could still survive but once inside the camp uh, the uh, ones who were uh, there will be a selection that happened that is when you go through it you will have to pass through a german officer Uh, and according to his whims and fancies, he will ask your age. If you are fifteen, sixteen, and above, you will be asked to go to the right. Right is where you survive. If you are less, you are a twelve-year-old child or a a fifty-year-old woman or a fifty-year-old man, you will be asked to go to the left. Left is where you go to the gas chamber and die immediately. So this was how gruesome it was. You know, your survival. Uh, depended on one word of this german officer so if those who survived the selection they were then uh, brought it to a place called the shower room a shower room is where uh, they were stripped of every clothing men and women but you know from there they segregated men into another camps and women into other camps so even if it was women there will be male officers standing there they will be stripped down to their uh, nothing to next to nothing and they were used to they were made to go through a cold shower you know if you know how cold it is in germany you will you cannot you will not even touch water so they went into the cold shower and uh, their hair was cut and they were hair was shaved not cut it was shaved completely and they were given a tattoo a names which was tattooed in their arms and then they were, they were given dresses it doesn't fit and they were given shoes shoes which were of different sizes you know they will have two left hand shoes and uh, they had no option at all what was given to them had to go so from then they went into camps 
where they work from there will be a roll call at 5 in the morning they will be given a very watery soup and then no food in the afternoon night they will have watery soup and a little piece of bread this was what their whole ration was uh, till they were liberated most of them are uh, died most of them died but there were still survivors but the ones who survived eli wiesel he was the one who wrote a very very powerful auto uh, holocaust uh, it's a seminal uh, introduction to holocaust uh, horrors that is night night is something uh, which was which was published much later 1960s and even then world did not believe that a very civilized nation like germany would have committed such atrocities they saw they thought it was beyond human imagination that it could not have happened but you know it was so hard for the survivors because after having been through so much they were not um, uh, they were not believed and so but uh, slowly the tattoos with their the tattoos on their arms people could not uh, not believe so the uh, the main the breaking of the iceberg started actually with eli wiesel because it is very important his night this is one of the most uh, powerful statements that he writes in the night it is the night the first night he went into the camp that he records it in his uh, autobiography if you are really interested in um, holocaust literature night is available in pdf it's not a very very voluminous book maybe uh, 100 pages or so download it and read it you it, it will totally um, make you empathize not even if not empathize to see how easy it is for us to kill a person if we are only convinced on an ideology why it is wrong to believe an ideology to an extent to kill other people uh, let me just read what he has written i think this is in this first or second page of his book never shall i forget that night the first night in the camp that turned my life into one long night seven times sealed never shall i forget that smoke never shall i forget the small faces of children whose bodies i saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky never shall i forget those flames that consumed my faith forever never shall i forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live never shall i forget those moments that murdered my god and my soul and turned my dream into ashes never shall i forget those things even where i condemned to live as long as god himself never so the, this is he was a very young boy and he came with his father and he tried so hard to save his father he even with a small piece of bread he used to give his father but his father became very very sick and uh, when the camp was about to be liberated if his father asked him to leave he said no you have to go because i cannot survive and he sees his father dying in front of his eyes that is something he could not bear it at all because uh, for a long time in the camp he saw to it by giving his own ration to his father that his father survived so this is very powerful uh, um record of mm. holocaust experiences this is actually a photograph how these uh, the camp was there and in this bunker there will be at least uh, six people who were put on top of another there is i think this person the one with the forehead on is really weasel this is a very very iconic uh, photograph all of them were barely bones they were only working machines they were not given food and this is how they looked they are, all these bunkers will be infested with lice they did not have enough warmth and uh, they did not have enough toilets also you know if you would read all those uh, life writing of these survivors it will beggar all human imagination any fiction you know there is a uh, uh, now people are writing a lot of holocaust fiction also even yesterday we had a uh, we had a discussion whether we will have a whether we is, is it allowed to write fiction on holocaust though we have a lot of fiction but there is also a controversy whether a boy in striped pajamas is a fiction and then the um, there was a response from a holocaust survivor and then uh, she says you know it's also romantic the thing is uh, two children sitting by the fence and uh, one fellow is um, uh, switching places this can only happen in imagination not in reality not in any camp no camp had this place where a, a child will be working because all ch children were murdered and even if a child survived he would never have a time to sit there so you know when that is why uh, those who have gone through this experience they are not very happy about the fiction writing because 
some of the things that happen inside the camp would beggar all human imagination people cannot think of such uh, cruelty which happens inside um you know for example if i were to recount uh, the experimentations which happened in uh, the camp it is quite quite um, um bizarre and unbelievable i'm uh, just reading a, a book called the zookeeper's wife where uh, germans were very very interested in uh, animal research they wanted to find the pure breeds actually one of the uh, key uh, german uh, nazi official he is a veterinary surgeon he wanted to find the uh, original bull which was uh, in germany that's called the tarpen so he tried to again this was also a eugenic research and in the course of a research uh, the animals had to be preserved so well for in for example one of the doctors who operated on a worm W O R M worm without anesthesia was uh, uh, dismissed. But you know, at that same point, World War really to find out. how um the handicap was uh, happening what they did was they took a full bodied uh, jewish prisoner and then they will break his uh, leg and they will try to recreate the handicap of a german soldier who was wounded in battle and then try and set the bones right all without giving anesthesia to the jewish patient jews were taken as guinea pigs whereas animals were given a lot of uh, comfort and and a lot of luxury so you see it's quite interesting you know this is this is why i said this beggars all human imagination because animals were um, given more importance than jews jews bodies were taken as guinea pigs and um, that is why none of their research uh, findings never saw the light of day and you know with with the holocaust research coming back to holocaust writing when holocaust writing we have uh, two kinds of uh, writings uh, for you if you want to kind of uh, pursue research in that one is the writings of victims uh, the first the previous slide i showed was the writings of survivors uh, these were most of them were survivors elie wiesel was a survivor and um, victor frankl was a survivor but you were people who wrote diaries and etty hillism was from uh, netherlands she was in westerbork camp actually she voluntarily when she had a choice she had a choice to escape but she turned down that she said i will also um, take part in all that my countrymen are going through and she, and she voluntarily submitted to go to the concentration camp she's from netherlands and it is a very powerful diary it's a it, it's a diary which runs to 800 pages and it was smuggled out and it was uh, and she gave it to a friend before leaving for the camp and then so we know all that that happened uh, annie frank also we um, i think in uh, when we speak of holocaust uh, most of us only know annie frank so she was uh, so that is what i thought i would also bring her in she was a survivor and elie wiesel um, has written a lot of books he has authored 57 books because till the last day you know he died only in 2016 he could not rest because he felt responsible for the 6 million dead he was always possessed always traumatized by the time he was in you know those who survived they lived with the trauma of the holocaust they could uh, the trauma we uh, we do a lot of trauma studies Uh, but you know we take a trauma of a childhood and equate it with the trauma of the holocaust now that you know what trauma it was you know to see um, their own uh, jewish uh, people taken to the camps and their bones were broken just to experiment how it has to be done again you know all these are something which is beyond and they have been witness to all that so the kind of um, um, trauma that they had was beyond all um, what we call it as trauma so he also was a very significant uh, uh, instrumental in establishing the Uni united states uh, holocaust memorial museum just as uh, memorialization is an important part of 
Jewish tradition. Remembering the dead is also a very, very important part. So you see, uh, I, I have uh, added some pictures uh, for US HMM. They were also survivor victims. I will show them at the end. So this is a third category. Uh, those who survived, but those who cannot uh, live life because of the drama, especially Tadeusz Borowski, he's a non-Jew, but he was uh, implicated in um, the, as a Sonda Commando. Sonda Commando is the able-bodied men were uh, chosen to dispose the dead bodies because every day there were so many dead bodies. So many people were killed in one gas chamber at one point of time at one sitting for one hour thousand people can be killed so you know do the math and you know how much dead bodies were there and they had to clear the dead bodies and he was too haunted and haunted for the rest of his life and uh after he survived though he survived after a point of time in life he he inhaled gas and he died because you know that was how majority of the jews were killed by cyclone b gas and again primo levy also he was an italian jew he survived and he committed suicide. He just walked out of a multi-storied building and he jumped to death. So you see people, those who survived were also living with the guilt. And also you have very, very um, unbelievable, as I said, bizarre accounts, especially Gisela Pearl. She was a gynecologist inside uh, Auschwitz. She was a doctor. Pregnant women will be killed immediately. So when um, she saw a pregnant woman, with her bare hands, she had to abort the babies inside the womb so that at least the mother will survive. You know, you know, uh, a conscientious uh, gynecologist who had to kill one life for another life. And that was again her trauma. But she came to New York and then she uh, wrote this. She said in an interview, after Holocaust, when I started practicing again, whenever I entered uh, for delivery, to deliver a baby, I always said, Lord, I owe this life to you because, you know, I have, she always was tormented with the guilt of killing so many people, so many people. So, you know, you have the, all the, all those who survived lived a very, very um, ha tormented lives later on also. You have, uh, she's a Hungarian surgeon, Ruth Luger. She died very recently. She's a German Jew. Charlotte Delbo was a non-Jew, but she was a partisan in the sense she was Marxist. So any um, uh, other ideas as, which, which does not espouse the nationalist ideology of Nazis were also killed. They were not imprisoned. They were also killed. And But she, uh, Charlotte Delbo, she uh, survived. She was one survivor. But she was treated differently because she was a French national and not a Jew. Um, if you want to get yourself uh, acquainted with the Holocaust, there are some films. Shoba is actually, it's a very, very long documentary. I think it runs to 10 or 12 hours. It, it is based on the witness accounts, uh, testimonies of survivors and all that. Schindler's List actually gives you from the German uh, savior who brought so many people there. And life is beautiful also. All these, you know, if you want to uh, know more on Holocaust, I think these the films will uh, help you. Uh, when I say Holocaust studies, Holocaust studies does not restrict itself to the texts that we spoke of, the life writing or the fiction. or But you, there is a very, very important uh, studies that we are not very familiar with. That is Holocaust memorialization. There are many museums which have been established. And these museums are not like how we see, how we have certain things put into boxes and we have uh, labeled them. It's not like that. They are interactive. You have video clips going on. You know, when you... Uh, I had... Uh, uh, a great uh, privilege and honor to visit both the U.S. HMM in Washington and very recently to Israel in Yad Vashem. I was there in July before all that happened. So Yad Vashem is a memorial that is in Jerusalem and U.S. HMM in uh, Washington, D.C. This is a huge five-story building. But as you enter into the museum, you have the raucous uh, voice of uh, staccato voice of Hitler shouting from speakers, and you are so uh, suffocated, you are so stunned by the voice then. Then we get to know how it was for the people, how it was with um, such a very voice, which a very, very strong and a staccato voice speaking and speaking against the Jews. So you have a very uh, immersive experience when you go into the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Not only it is the pictures, 
uh, they have a huge wall. Uh, I I could not get that picture, but there is a glass wall, uh, which is um, in the well of all the five stories. So on all five stories, inside when you you know it's like a it's like a circle, and with that you have a huge glass plate, and in that glass plate they have um, inscribed all the names of six million who perished. So this is how they have done it in USHMM. And also there are a different modes of uh, a memorialization. Yeah, this is uh, what you see here. This is in Yad Vashem. In Yad Vashem, this is a huge scroll of books. The same length you have on the other side also. This is actually, these are the names. These are the what you see as in a different color. These are the names of all the people who perished. And this goes to so many papers. You can just uh, leaf through them. They are like um, uh, as a leaf. They are different leaves. And uh, entire length of this and also entire length of the other side. So this is the way they, uh, this is called the book of names. The entire thing is called the book of names. This is how they memorialize. And uh, this is the maximum, the pictures. This is also in Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is, uh, means memorial. It's taken from Isaiah 56, 5, that I will give a memorial. This is memorial for the dead because in Jewish tradition, a dead body has to be uh, buried and um, it has to be, a prayer has to be said over it. Since they did not have, because, you know, when they were taken to gas chambers, after their bodies died, uh, the, it was like a, a grill. If you know the grill thing is the the base of the gas chamber was as a grill after they died the grill opened up to an incinerator so all the bodies were uh, turned into ash and then uh, germans were very ingenious they had huge trucks waiting so all the ash was taken as fertilizer to german fields so you know one reason why the produce was very fertile that was and they did not uh, uh, lose out on anything of the jewish body so they are photographs and the photographs are all pasted here so that they are remembered because they do not have a grave. They do not have a place of rest after their death. So they are remembered in names. They are remembered in pictures. And this is something which is so powerful. You know, when you go at, uh, there is a, a 90 degree, 180 degree corner. And when you round that corner, a huge room has full of these shoes. They have actually taken, collected all the shoes of the victims and they have put this in USHMM and you still smell those shoes. That's one of the most um, unforgettable moments of your life. If you would still go there and that is one thing you cannot forget. You cannot forget the smell of the shoes. You know how they have been, um, those, the ones who became victims in Holocaust Memorial Museums were those who were so rich, so rich in that, um, recently, uh, yeah, one of my scholars, she had done this, gave, given this uh, um, record where on an average, on one day, uh, you know, as the victims were coming into the camps, they will shave their heads, they will put the tattoo and they will also, a dentist will also be there because in those days, Jews had uh, golden fillings in their teeth. When there is a, a loose, uh, when they had to pluck a teeth out, they will fill it with a golden teeth. So on an average per day, the uh, gold that they extracted from the gold teeth of Jewish prisoners were 70 pounds. Can you imagine 70 pounds on one day? So imagine it was going for four or five years and the amount of gold that they had from within the body of a Jew, not only from that, and they also made their fats, they used the bodies as um, sites of experiments. So these were uh, something which you think was out of a very horror movie, but these things have happened. If they have happened in the recent past, it can still happen again. You know, when um, they only when you trace the uh, path of genocide, the path of genocide happens when a majority of people are convinced that one group of people uh, should be killed. It's okay to be killed. They are in, you can dispense because they belong to a race. You can dispense because they belong to a tribe. They can be killed because they belong to, they have a different uh, color of hair. They have a different style of dressing. They speak a different language. You know, these uh, non-entities, if you are convinced that 
you know people can be disposed because they do not align to what you think is right and correct again a genocide will happen so you know when you study uh, the mechanics of a genocide how this genocide happened and how this horrendous thing has worked out uh it is no wonder that it can still happen uh for those of you who will still be interested i will these are some of the online resources you can go to ushmm that gives you a very good uh, collection and uh, you can also go to the youtube videos i have put where uh, defining an unimaginable crime is lemkin story it's quite fascinating if you have time do read that and this is on uh, emmanuel ringelblum's the onek shabat so with this i uh, come to an end of my lecture